Winston Churchill was at a dinner party. And um, at this dinner party, the, the topic of conversation went like this. If you couldn't be who you are, who would you like to be? <laughs> it's an interesting question. If you couldn't be who you are, who would you like to be? And it started going around the table, and he was the last one to speak. And everyone was wondering, what is Winston Churchill going to say? He stands up, and he says, if I couldn't be Winston Churchill. And he reaches down, and he grabs the, wife, or the hand of his, his wife. He said, if I couldn't be Winston Churchill... I would like to be the second husband of the fair lady Churchill right here. And you think, oh, what a great answer, right? Because if you pick any other man, he's married to someone else, and she's going to think, did he pick her because he really likes that? You know, that's just not going to be good. So I tell you that because of this. We're in a marriage series. We're wrapping it up today. We've called it Woven, creating marriages that are safe, satisfying, and steamy, all right? Um, we're wrapping this up with our fifth category. If you remember this diagram, we came up with this concept that the, the, we didn't come up with this concept. Let me just say this. This is a biblical concept. The, the center, the goal of marriage is oneness. Keeping couples connected to each other so that they feel one, united, and connected. The opposite of that, the enemy of it, is what? It's isolation. It doesn't mean that they're not there with you. It just means that you feel very alone. And we picked five categories that actually build the oneness in marriage. So we talked one week on each of these, expectations, conflict, communication, sex. Today we're talking about faith. Um, do you remember why we did this series? Why we started this? Um, God talks an awful lot about relationships. There was actually a study uh, that went on for 72 years where a Harvard study tracked people to say what, meant, what created a happy, meaningful life for people. And for 72 years this went on, and there was a professor who was in charge of it for 40 years. He poured over all of the data to say what made these people's lives happy and meaningful. And you would think it'd be really complicated. Someone asked him, what would you learn in all this? He said, well, really, there's only one thing in life that makes people happy and makes life meaningful. It's relationships. And we believe that the scripture says this. It's first relationship with God, then relationship with yourself, and then relationship with each other. So if life boils down to relationships, some of the most important relationships are with our spouse. And so whether you are single, single again, married, we just felt it was worth it for all of us to talk this through to say, what can we learn from the scriptures about marriage? And so this diagram here, each of those categories is an expression of oneness. If you think about oneness, on your best days when marriage is awesome, those, those are all categories that, that are expressions of oneness. But how many of you, every day is your best day? It's not, right? So those categories aren't just expressions of oneness. They're paths where we work our way back to oneness. You all with me? And that's why some people say, we really need to work on our marriage. Because legitimately, there, there's some work to do on marriage. Now, let me say one more thing before I jump into where I'm headed. By the way, I'm going to be in Ephesians 5 eventually. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. Um, maybe for some of you, you've dug in these five weeks. You've been coming, you've been going to community group, you've been kind of doing some extra reading on this, and for five weeks you're like, I'm gonna, we're going to make our marriage better. What if you've been trying and there hasn't been this monumental jump in the health of your marriage? What if it actually created more arguments? Can, can I just say this? Um, you are not building a shed, you're building a mansion. You can build a shed in a weekend, Right? But you can't build a mansion in a weekend. If you're going to build a healthy marriage, it will take time and time and time. Keep building it. Listen to what statistics say. Listen to this. Uh, these researchers grabbed couples and they asked about the happiness of their marriage. Some couples said, we are very unhappy. We are just unhappy. We're neutral. Or we're happy or very happy. Listen to what they found. Researchers found this. Two-thirds of the unhappily married spouses who stayed married reported that their marriages were happy five years later. In addition, the most unhappy marriages, the one on the far side, reported the most dramatic turnarounds. Among those who rated their marriages as very unhappy, almost eight out of ten of them who, avoid, who avoided divorce were happily married five years later. Why do I tell you that? Don't give up. Keep going. It, I would ask you this, what's the one next thing you're going to do? Because we're wrapping up the series today. What's the one next thing that you're going to do to build your marriage? Because you ain't building a shed, right? No one wants a shed marriage. We all want a mansion marriage, right? Something that is of great value and strongly built. What's the one thing you're going to do as you move forward? 
Um, Here's where we're going to go today. The last category is the category of faith. Do people of faith, and by that I mean Christians, people who have this faith in Jesus Christ of what he did on the cross for us, and you have this relationship with a living God, if you have this faith in God, and I don't just mean faith in your marriage like, oh, I believe it's going to be okay and hope is going to rise. No, no. You have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Do you think that people who have faith in Jesus have a distinct advantage at having a better marriage? It's an interesting question. Meaning you have an advantage over those people who don't have faith in Christ. And by the way, in this room we have people of faith and people who are not of faith yet. And you're, you're checking this out. I'm so glad you're here. Maybe this is one of those reasons why you might consider having faith in Jesus Christ. That I think that we as Christians have a distinct advantage at having better marriages. I'm going to tell you why. Um, Oftentimes, we'll say things in church or people repeat words like this, just like, hey, God loves you. And we say that, but we don't understand the depth of it, the brilliance of it, the color of it, the beauty of it. Because we also say things like, I love pizza. I love ice cream. And oh yeah, by the way, I love you too, honey. And yet, what do we really mean by that? The term that says God loves you, If we understood the beautiful, vibrant color of it, it would begin to change who we are. So here's where we're going to go. I'll eventually get to Ephesians 5, but here's where I want to start. The gospel, the good news that Jesus died for you because he loves you, forgives you, was resurrected back from the dead. The gospel reveals the colorful ways that Jesus loved. I'm going to say that again. The gospel reveals the colorful ways that Jesus loved. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to walk you through some stories that are found in the gospels. The word gospel just means good news. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Here's why I'm going to tell you some of these stories. How he interacts with people reveals the depth and the beauty of his love. Because eventually we're going to get to this place. Listen to this. Don't miss this. This is the whole morning right here. How God loved you. How God loved us, here's what you're supposed to do. Go love your spouse just like that. Well, what does that look like? I mean, if I'm supposed to love my spouse the way God loves me, and all I tell you is, hey, God loves you, and you don't understand the beauty, the brilliance, and the color of that, I want us to dig into how Jesus loved people. So here we go. John chapter 4 reveals this story where Jesus is in the south. He needs to go to the north. And the apostle John writes this, this sentence in here. He says, Now he had to go through Samaria, which is weird because he's in the south. He has to go to the north. There's lots of ways to get to the north. You could go this way through Samaria, but there's an awful lot of other ways. They're they're a little bit longer, but there's plenty of trails that can go there. There's plenty of roads that will get there. But John says Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? We find out why by the person that he meets there. They come up on this town, Sakaar. They stop outside the city, uh, the place where the well is, and his disciples go into town to go get supplies and food, and Jesus sits by this well, and this woman comes up. She comes up, and the Bible's very specific. She comes up at the hottest part of the day. Why? Because she lived a really shameful life. And she didn't want to be harassed by the other women in town and remind her about how she is less than the rest of them. Jesus meets her there. They have this long conversation, and At the end of the conversation, he says, would you go and get your husband? Mm. She replies, I don't have a husband. And then in that instant, Jesus says something that brings all of her shameful past and present and reveals it and exposes all of it. He says this, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands and the man that you you now have is not your husband. Like, oh, well, that's really loving of Jesus, isn't it? Here's why it's loving. He exposes all of the crap of her life. But in that moment at the same time, he offers her friendship. Because you know who your friends are. You know who loves you when they know your stuff. And they love you anyways. And it's interesting because instead of this unbelievable shame, he offers her friendship. And it says this. She runs back to the town where she, grew, where she lived. She said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? 
She realized how miraculous this is. He shouldn't know this. She realizes he's not condemning her. He's actually inviting her to have friendship. And she invites the whole town. Here's what's interesting. The town comes out, and in the end it says, many people from her town came to believe in Jesus. See, I think the love of Jesus has words. I think there's things that Jesus has said to people. I don't think we actually have the entire conversation that Jesus spoke to the woman that day. But I think that that woman needed to hear something. I think that this is what she needed to hear. You are valuable even if you devalue yourself. And I think that's what love says. That's what Jesus' love says for people. You are valued by me. Even if you've lived a life where you made choices, you made mistakes, you made decisions that have devalued yourself. That's what the woman is experiencing that day. Because that's what love says. That's the brilliant, beautiful, colorful way that Christ loves us. It's not a two-dimensional, bland kind of love that says, yes, I love you and pizza and ice cream all at the same time. This one says, you're valuable to me. In Mark 1, Jesus uh, first begins his ministry, and he invites these men to follow him. And he doesn't go and find the best of the best. He finds Peter and Andrew, James, and John, who were fishermen. You see, when Jewish boys, they would go to school, they would go to school for a certain amount of time. And then the cream of the crop, the smartest, the best, the most capable, those with the highest ceiling, they were invited to sit at the feet of a rabbi and follow a rabbi and learn from that rabbi. And the rest of them, who just weren't as smart, as capable, who just couldn't do it, they would just go back and join the family business. And so when Jesus meets these four men, they are fishermen and they are fishing with their dad. Because why? Because they're not the best of the best. Because they're not the smartest, they're not the greatest, but don't miss this. Jesus was about to start a worldwide movement that would transcend more than 2,000 years, spread all over the globe, and you're not going to grab the best men? You're not going to grab the most capable? Jesus invites these four men to follow him. Why? Because he loved them. And I think Jesus' love has words like this, you are capable beyond what people have told you. See, when you love somebody, let me just, parents, right? Maybe your kids here at school, how dumb they are, how bad they are, how, I mean, the negative conversation that goes on between kids is unbelievable, right? Guys, we call that humor. It's terrible, but that's what it is. And we hear about how incapable we are. And Jesus approaches these four men, and he says, you're capable beyond what people have told you. It wasn't just men who followed Jesus. There were a bunch of women who followed Jesus too. Two of the most famous that you've probably heard of before is Mary and Martha. Jesus shows up at their house one day and Martha freaks out. Oh my gosh, I have nothing made. She runs to the kitchen. She's in a frantic cleaning and and cooking and making all this food. And her sister uh, Mary decides she's not going to help Martha. And she sits at Jesus' feet to learn from him. (laughs) Um, We don't get it today, but 2,000 years ago, Um, Mary did something that was totally socially unacceptable. You don't do that. Women don't sit at the feet of a rabbi. But Mary's like, I'm sitting here because I want to learn from him. And Martha, she walks in the room, you know, flour all over her face, sweating apron around her, and she looks at Mary like, are you kidding me? You're going to sit there at the feet of the rabbi. First of all, you shouldn't do that. And Jesus, he should know that you shouldn't do that. So why isn't Jesus telling her to get over here? By the way, I'm all alone in the kitchen. Help me out. And Jesus, he has some words for Martha, the one in the kitchen. He says, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one thing. Listen to this, what he says. Mary has chosen what is better. Mary has chosen relationship. Mary's chosen that one thing because Jesus really wants that one thing. He wants that thing that's colorful, where someone sits with him at his feet. Because I think Jesus' kind of love says this, I want to be with you. I don't want you serving me in the kitchen and not having relationship with me. If you understand that God loves you, listen to this. He not only loves you, he wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with you because we believe he loves us because he's supposed to love us. He's like God's son. It's like in his job description. But he likes you and wants to be with you. Are you getting this? 
Remember where this started? God said, you want to have a, a great marriage? Here's what you do. The way that I love you, I just want you to love your spouse that way. We'll get to where it says that in a minute. But do you understand the beautiful, vibrant ways that God actually loves us? It has words that says, you're valuable to me. You're worth it. I want to be with you. I'm just going to keep going. I got a couple more stories for you. John chapter 8. One day Jesus is walking in the temple area. And at some point, some hypocritical religious leaders, they drag before Jesus and the crowd that's walking with him, this woman. And the text says that she was found in the act of adultery. And they throw her down in front of Jesus and they say, hey, by the way, the Old Testament says, oh, they wouldn't call it the Old Testament, excuse me. The scripture says what we're supposed to do with these women. They're to be killed. Jesus, what do you say? They're trying to trap him. They're trying to get him to say something against the, the scriptures and against God. And Jesus, it says, he gets down and he just starts writing with his finger in the dirt and doesn't say anything. And they, they press him on it. He finally stands up and he says, anyone who is without sin, you go ahead and you throw the first stone. He's like, okay, let's, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll go ahead and stone her. But you who are perfect, you who are without sin, you've never done anything wrong. You go ahead and pick up a stone and you throw first and we'll follow your lead. And it says one by one, the older to the younger, they slowly walk away. Because everyone realized we're not innocent. Here's the woman and here's Jesus. And he stands up, he looks at her and asks her a question. Where'd they go? Do they not condemn you? And she says, no, they, they didn't. And then here's his words, neither do I condemn you, go and leave your life of sin. Two really important, powerful words. First of all, neither do I condemn you, but go now and leave your life of sin. He doesn't say to her, hey, what you did is no big deal. Hey, what you did is, is not a problem. What he says to her is this, listen, you are forgiven when you don't deserve it. You're forgiven. You're forgiven by God. You're forgiven by me. But it's interesting that he doesn't give her permission to keep on sinning. He says, go away and change your life. Do it differently than you've ever done before, which I think leads to another set of words of love from Jesus. And um, it sounds weird, but it's three words. Here it is. Ready? You're transformable. I think what he's saying is this. You can change, and change is possible. The fact that you live like this before doesn't mean that you have to live like that in the future. The fact that there was shame in the past doesn't mean that your future can't be one of purity and walking with me, that you're a changed person. In John 13, it brings us to maybe the greatest demonstration of love outside the cross. Don't miss this. John 13 brings us to the greatest demonstration of love outside the cross. Jesus is meeting with his disciples. He's meeting with, with them when he's about to go to the cross and die. It's the dinner that he had with them that we now know as the Last Supper. Think about it. He's going into his darkest hour. What should Jesus be focused on? Probably himself. Whew, man, I got to get ready for this. I, I know that this trial's coming. I know that, that there's a lot that follows that that is going to be painful, that, that is horrible. And I, I need to be geared up for me. But it's not. It's interesting. He's totally focused on his followers. This is how the story is introduced. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Don't miss this. He loved them to the end. I think the words that Jesus had, his love is so colorful that he said, I will be faithful to you. Even in my darkest hour, I'm going to think about you, you can count on me. I won't let you down. And even though you don't get it right all the time, I'm going to be faithful to you. That's how beautiful his love is. This story goes on. And if you know something about the Jewish tradition, when people would walk in a house after walking on a dirty, dusty road, when you walked in the house, uh, the lowest servant would wash the feet of the people who came in so they'd be clean for dinner. It's not how it happened. Listen to this. So Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And can you see the disciples the moment that Jesus gets up to do that? They're like, don't! Oh, someone forgot to wash the feet. Nobody did that. Now Jesus is getting up to do it. Oh, somebody should have. Someone called the servant. 
he gets to Peter. He goes to wash Peter's feet, and he says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And then Peter says, no, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. By the way, if you're going to tell Jesus no, you better be sure what you're talking about. (laughs) I think what Jesus' love was saying at this moment is, listen, Peter, I will serve you even if you don't appreciate it, even if you don't understand it. My love for you is so beautiful, so deep, so colorful, that even if you don't get it or totally understand it, I just want you to know this. I will serve you. Huh. At the same dinner, Peter turns from saying, no, Jesus, don't do that, to actually bragging about himself. Because at that dinner, uh, Jesus mentioned, hey, by the way, you're going to fail me. All of you are going to walk away from me. And Peter's like, oh, not me. He starts bragging about how courageous he is. I would never walk away from you, Jesus. Jesus just lets him know, you're not so courageous. You're actually more cowardly than you are courageous. He says, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Jesus is arrested. During the trial in a courtyard outdoors, Jesus um, can hear Peter as Peter speaks the words, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that man. Peter runs away weeping because of the reality of his failure. And then listen, Jesus goes to the cross. And Peter is left knowing that the last words that Jesus ever heard him utter were the words of betrayal. I don't know him. Could you imagine? You followed him around for three years and the last words Jesus hears from you is, I don't know him. It's your denial. And we know that the story doesn't end there, but Peter didn't know that at that moment. So for three days he is wrecked and he goes back to fishing. And as he's fishing, he sees someone on the beach and recognizes it's Jesus. He jumps in, swims for shore. And he shares a meal with Jesus on the beach. And while on the beach, Jesus asks him, hey, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, I, I, I love you. And he asks him a second time, Peter, do you love me? You, you know I love you, Jesus. He asked him a third time, and the the moment he asked him that third time, you knew it had to sting Peter, because Peter recognized what it is that he's doing. The same way I denied you three times, you just asked me if I love you three times. Ah, Peter's heart just breaks like, Jesus, you know I love you. But I think what's interesting is that after each time that Peter says, you know I love you, Jesus, Jesus gives him an invitation. Here's the invitation. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, take care of my lambs. And again, Peter, feed my sheep. Even though Peter failed more than all the other disciples, Jesus still offered him leadership of the church. I think it's the colorful nature of Jesus' love that says this, Peter, you're worth it even when you blow it. I wonder if our love says that. See, the big picture here, we say things like, yeah, God loves you, but it feels black and white. It feels like this two-dimensional, hazy kind of love. It lacks the beauty and the color and the vibrancy of the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated that you and I get to read about. And if you've accepted, if you're a person of faith, you've accepted that Jesus loves you that way, can you actually go and love people that way? I think his love has words. Question. Do any of these statements, have you experienced these before? Did you come to a place where you realized you are valuable even if you've lived a life that has devalued yourself? Do you ever sense that from God? Have you ever realized that you're actually way more capable beyond what anybody has told you? Do you believe that God says, I want to be with you? Do you believe that he says, not just believe it, but you've experienced, you are forgiven even though you don't deserve it? Do you believe that you're transformable, that change is possible? Do you believe that Jesus says to you, I will be faithful to you? Do you believe that Jesus says, I will serve you even if you don't appreciate it? You are worth it even when you blow it. Have you ever felt that? Because if you have, you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that he loves you not because of who you are, because of what he's done for you. He loves you in a colorful, vibrant, powerful way. Now, don't miss this because this is the hinge that everything turns on. When you came to faith in Jesus, and as you grew in your faith, you experienced God's generous love for you. But here it is. 
your faith experience, the one where you now understand this great, amazing love he has for you, that is the path to oneness with your spouse. Go and love your spouse the same way that Christ loved the church. Let me ask this question. Let's change it around. Which of these words does your spouse need to hear? Does he or she need to hear these words, you are valuable even if you've done something that has devalued yourself? Do they need to hear you're capable beyond what people have told you? Do they just need to hear with you from you, I want to be with you? Do they need to hear you're forgiven, even though we know you don't deserve it? Do they need to hear the words you're transformable, change is possible? Do they need to hear the words from you, I will be faithful to you? Do they need to hear, I will serve you even if you don't understand it, get it, or appreciate it? Maybe they need to hear the words, finally, you're worth it even when you blow it. I would just ask this this morning. Out of all the words that love says, what does your spouse need to hear? Where do I get this from? Is there any place in the Bible that says... You're to love your spouse the same way that Christ loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, here's what it says. Husbands. It doesn't say it to the wives. It says it to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's why I walked us through. All of those stories about how Jesus loves people. And some of you would say, well, that's just how Jesus loves the church. Well, the church didn't come into existence until after the resurrection. But all the stories you told were about people that Jesus loved before the resurrection. Who made up the church after the resurrection? All these people that Jesus had relationship and loved on. And we have a, a, a written account of how he loved them. The same way Jesus loved them? Go love your spouse that way. That's what this says. If you have faith in Christ, it's more than a mental belief. You've experienced his love for you. Now let that change you and love your spouse in the same way. I think it's interesting. In, um, in Ephesians chapter 5, it tells the husbands three times, love your wives, love your wives, love your wives. Guys, sometimes it takes repetition, right? Before we're going to get it. Love your wives. And I know that there's moments... In marriage that get tough and we ask, well, how much? Well, to what degree? And for how long? Sometimes it gets hard. But let me share with you a couple things that it says in chapter 5 here that, that might help you. The first is this. Most people, when they talk about marriage in this passage, they start at verse 21. It talks about this mutual submission thing. I'll get to that in a minute. But I don't think it actually even begins there. I think it actually starts up in verse 18. And he's writing to Christians, Paul is writing to Christians about what it is that they should do with their lives. And he says this, be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? That means Christ lives in you, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, which means this. If you totally understand the gospel that Jesus loved you enough to die for you, he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit of God living in you, meaning this. Guys, it is not in and of your own power to love your wives. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God in you that is equipping you to do that. Are you with me? That's why I think you have a distinct advantage at having a really healthy, beautiful marriage. Number one, you have the model of Christ. The second is, He actually lives in you to empower the change. I said it this way, your faith enables God's transforming power to live in you. The second part of this marriage uh, ideal from the book of Ephesians comes from verse 21 and it says this submit to one another out of reverence for Christ um, one pastor said it this way I loved it he said marriage is a submission competition marked by love and respect it's a submission competition another pastor said it this way he said marriage is a race to the back of the line no, I'm going to the back you first no 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 not you I'll go last you go first no 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 you first like Mutually submit to one another. Put your, your spouse's needs ahead of your own. Both of you. Not just the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband. Both husbands and wives mutually submit to what the other person needs. Can I just ask you this? What do you need for your marriage? You come up with a list, right? You know why you can come up with a list? Because we think a lot about what would make us happy. Don't we? 
Can I ask you this? Um, what does your spouse need for them to have a great marriage? I don't know about you, but it, it takes me a moment. Okay, okay, wait, wait. She needs um, this and this. And eventually I can come up with the list. But if you ask me what I need, I'd be like, okay, here's the 12 things in alphabetical order. I know what they are. You know why? Because I think about them more. We naturally think about we, what we want, what we like, what we need. Why? Because we care about us. What words does your spouse need to hear? And do we spend time thinking about this mutual submission that says, I'm going to meet their needs before I ever try to meet mine? I'm going to read the next verse. I'm going to tell you this. In our culture, people hate these words. People in our culture hate these because they've been abused for so long. And I'm just going to read them to you. I want you to hear them. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he's the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, I'm just going to tell you this. Don't be ashamed of these words. Most people read these, particularly if they're not people of faith. They're like, oh my gosh, the Bible is old. It's old and old school, totally irrelevant. Why would you ever tell wives to submit to your husbands? It's so culturally inappropriate. Let me just tell you why people hate this for two reasons. Men are overly aggressive about this or they're totally passive about it. Over the last 2,000 years, men have used these words to dominate women and pretend like they had God's approval. These verses are not an excuse to boss your wife around, tell her what to wear, when to have sex, or what career she should have. That's the overly aggressive. The passive part is like men take the title of, oh, I get to be the head in my household, right? And then they become passive, but the reality of the marriage is that the woman is the glue to the relationship and she's doing all the work to keep the family together. You got the title, but you're not doing any of the work. Now, guys, I'm not harping on you, right? I'm, I'm just saying this is why people hate this verse. That's not what this scripture talks about. When you're a person of faith and you understand the unbelievable love of God and then you mutually submit to one another to say, I'm going to treat my spouse like she's more important than I am. And she's going to treat me like I'm more important than she is. You're submitting to someone who's going to put you first. That doesn't sound so bad. And I'll tell you this, I, oftentimes when we read this, we think it's all about authority. Who has the authority? It's the wrong question. It's not about authority in this passage. I'll just say it this way. Marriage isn't about getting authority, but it's about taking responsibility. Guys, real honest, you're, you're going to be held responsible before God in a way that your wife is not. That's, I think, what this says. There's a responsibility for us to nurture, to love, to care for, and to not shove this aside to say, oh my gosh, that sounds like a book from antiquity. It's embarrassing that it's, no, 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 no. This is actually God's design for how marriages thrive today. I'm going to say one more thing here. And it's my disclaimer. And I almost hesitate to say this. I almost left this out of my message because of this. Someone's going to misuse my words right now. Someone's going to take what I'm about to say. And you're going to feel like I just gave you God's blessing to do something selfish. You're going to try and justify a behavior that you've wanted to do for a while. You've been thinking about it. It's, kind of, it's selfish on your part. And you're going to think I'm going to give you permission to do this. So be very, very careful. I'm going to give this disclaimer anyway, though, because I think it's important. Here it is. Unconditional love doesn't mean unconditional relationship. Unconditional love doesn't mean unconditional relationship. God is not inviting women or men to a substandard life living in subjection to a selfish spouse. If your man wants to behave in such a way that degrades and devalues you, you can love him unconditionally, but it doesn't mean that you're in an unconditional relationship with him. Let me explain it this way. Um, the Wild West. We all live in the West, right? West Coast here. Wild West, you know, guns slinging, gold searching after time in history. A bunch of men come out West without a lot of women coming out here. You put a bunch of men who are fighting over stuff in the Wild West. It's a pretty rowdy, crazy group of people. You know what tamed the Wild West? Women. Have you ever watched a rowdy group of guys and a strong woman comes walking in the room and she's hot? And the guys are like, oh. They all of a sudden develop some manners they never even knew they had. I've watched this happen. If you have, do you have a son? I have a son. Girl walks in the room. She's kind of cute. He's like, oh, hello. Not all the time. Not right away. But eventually, like, 
we, we had dinner and there were some girls over and all of a sudden he's clearing the table and I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> it's not just any woman. It's strong women who have tamed men throughout history. And what I mean by this is this. Weak women will come in and just say, you can treat me however you want. I will just unconditionally love you and unconditionally be in relationship with you so you can abuse me, use me, and do me whatever you want, and I'll just always be here. That's a weak woman. And that doesn't change men, actually. It's strong women who come in and say, if you want to be a part of me, I will love you unconditionally, but our relationship has conditions. You will treat me like a lady. Mm. Unconditional love does not mean unconditional relationship. Now, remember, I told you, some people are going to misuse my words. Feel like I gave them permission and God gave them permission to do something selfish because you felt like someone didn't treat you fair in your marriage. Um, marriage isn't fair. That's why we're called to serve and love, but it's about mutual submission and love. Here's the ideal. Are you ready? A person of faith who has experienced the beautiful love of God meets another person of faith who understands and has experienced the beautiful love of God. And on their best day together, they get it right and serve each other and submit to each other. And that man puts her first and it's beautiful. But we don't always have our best days, right? I will tell you this, people of faith, you have a distinct advantage. An empowering and a clarity of what love looks like to make your marriage great. Um, <clears throat> I just wonder this morning, what does your spouse need to hear from you today? <clears throat> As I wrap up these questions, um, or this moment, I've heard people say this, you know, the key to marriage is what? What would you say? The key to marriage is communication. The key to marriage is good sex. The key to marriage is what? Well, I mean, you probably had an answer to it. Out of all the categories, Nancy, go back to that diagram real quick. Out of all the categories that are found here, there's five. There's probably 10, 12, 20 categories that will build oneness in your marriage. I just talked about five of these for five weeks. I will tell you this. The number one key to marriage is not communication. It is your faith. It's your faith in God that transforms you. To be the kind of person who can love when that other person is not lovable. It's the one that says, I forgive you and I love you. It speaks all of these words. You are valuable even if you've devalued yourself. You're capable beyond what people have given you credit for. I want to be with you. You are forgiven when you don't deserve it. You're transformable and things can change. I will be faithful to you. I will serve you even if you don't appreciate it. And you're worth it even when you blow it. What words does your spouse need to hear from you today? Um, we're going to end our... Uh, service today by receiving communion. Remember that last supper we talked about where Jesus was with his disciples the night before his death? At that dinner, he broke bread. And they didn't exactly get what was happening, but they did after the resurrection. He broke bread. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. And then he took a cup and he said, this wine, this is my blood. And it's my blood of the new covenant, the new relationship that we're going to have. And then these disciples ate it and drank it. And after the resurrection, they understood that for Christians, for the last 2,000 years, we break bread, eat it as the symbol of Jesus' body broken for our sins. And we drink that juice or wine as the symbol of his blood. And we're celebrating his beautiful, vibrant, colorful love for us. And so we're going to end our service that way. And um, can I just suggest that if you're here with your spouse... Go grab some of those. They're at the tables around the room if you're new to our church. We, we leave these out every week, but once a month we really try to spend time doing this together. And if you're with your spouse, would you take communion together today? I will, I'm not going to force you to, but I would just invite you to. And would you think as you're walking over there, God, what does my spouse need to hear from me today? This is all about Christ and you, but he's brought you together. And so maybe before you eat and drink, would you utter some of these words? And maybe the words that she needs to hear or he needs to hear is um, the three most powerful words, I think, in the English language that say, I am sorry if it hasn't gone well, if it's been hard, 
that you would simply say, I'm sorry, or maybe I value you. You are unbelievably capable, more so than I've ever told you. And speak words of love and life to them. And then eat and drink and enjoy your time together for a moment. And if your spouse isn't here or you don't have a spouse, I, go take this. Spend a moment and just tell Jesus how much you appreciate his gift of his body and his blood that was shed and, and broken for you so that you could be forgiven. And just tell him that. And then they eat and drink. And the band's going to come out in just a moment and they're going to lead us through a song. And I just want you to have a moment with Jesus and celebrate that. Um, got it? Are we good? I pray that God blesses your marriages. I pray God blesses your relationships with the same kind of love that you've received from him. Go love each other that way. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Jesus, thanks. Thanks for your unbelievable example, God. We can never be completely like you. We're just, we're not that generous. But if you really fill us and equip us and empower us and you change us, God, we have a hope at having not just a surviving marriage, but a thriving one, one where joy and laughter will meet. And even though there's sometimes pain in marriage, we, uh, we take it all together just to say, God, there's a richness to your love that we want to experience in between us. Help us to get that. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for us. We're about to celebrate this, and we don't take it lightly. We thank you for your generosity towards us, God. And it's all because of your love, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as our band plays, I would invite you to go take communion. And by the way, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, you can't do this in remembrance of what he's done if he hasn't done it for you. So if you're not yet a Christian, maybe contemplate, why am I not? What's holding me back from that? And maybe today is that day that you cross the line of faith where you say, you know what? I do believe this and I need this to transform me and I need to be forgiven. And it's only by Jesus' death on the cross. And so if you need to cross that line of faith, do that. Tell him. And then you're welcome to take communion with us and celebrate it for the first time. But if you're not, I'm so glad you're here. I just think you've got some important questions to talk to him about. So let's do this. Uh, if you want to go ahead and receive communion, go to any one of the four stations around the room and have a moment with God.